Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jim Conlon and welcome to our entertainment show here. And as you know, uh, we've been previewing it all week. Uh, we were debuting a new season of our Stargate uh, documentary. It was, went down to wonderful success at uh, season one, all of 38 uh, episodes in season one. Uh, it was a huge success, our star. Stargate sci-fi called classic documentary. It obviously, as you know, we're featuring speaking to actors who appeared in Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, Stargate Consortium, Stargate Universe, Stargate Origin, and the Stargate movie itself. And uh, so far, we've spoken to an awful lot of cast members and uh, we're delighted to be back for season two. We have some great people coming up. We have some great actors who played prominent roles uh, enlightening us about their stories and their special memories of playing a role within the Stargate universe. And today we're delighted to be joined by the one and only Peter Stebbing. If you're wondering, Peter Stebbing sort of role within the Stargate universe. He played the, the Tok'ra, the Tok'ra Malik. Uh, as you're probably aware, in terms of the Tok'ra, they were the sort of enemies of the Gauls. Yes, indeed, there were snakes, but there were the good snakes, uh, dare we say. And uh, Peter was a prominent uh, member of that sort of society. He was the leader of the Tok'ra base. And uh, Peter, first of all, uh, for you, you came into Stargate maybe two or three seasons uh, in, in terms of, and at that stage, uh, it reached a, a sort of popularity after season one or season two. It sort of took off big time. It uh, expanded from Canada to USA and then it spread throughout all the English speaking countries in the, the world. So when you signed up for Stargate, obviously it was probably the big thing in Vancouver at that time. Dash and Battlestar uh, Galactica were the, probably the two prominent sci-fi shows. Did you know that you were auditioning for really a hit TV show, a winning sort of cable show, or were you very much in the dark in terms of its popularity? I, I think I have to admit that I was very much in the dark. Um, I was working on the MGM lots with um, Peter Deloise on a, on a adjacent show that was not as successful, uh, that was written by J. Michael Straczynski called Jeremiah, and this was with Luke Perry and Malcolm Jamal Warner and Sean Astin. And so they just offered me this part as a Tokra on Stargate. So I said, sure, why not? You know, this is, this felt like something I could do. So I jumped into a universe that was um, uh, well-established. And I think I was sort of um, friends with Michael Shanks and also a little bit with Lexa Doig. I'd, met Alexa Doig and Chris Judge and those guys. I mean, we would bump into each other on the lot quite a lot. And so Peter DeLuise was the director that brought me over. He had worked with us on, on this show called Jeremiah. And so he brought me over to Stargates and I did a couple of Stargates for him. And I think they wanted me to be a part of some more, in fact. And I remember they were calling, but I was way off on the other side of Canada at the time and I couldn't do it so I, I was able to get two under my belt is what I believe and uh and Peter yeah oh no sorry no. Peter do do continue I'm sorry to cut across you there no you were... no I I and it was uh it was just entering a world that I I don't think I fully appreciated then or really since how um, how how the breadth of the show and how wide it had traveled until until I was invited to a convention in London. Um, that was one when I realized, oh my goodness, this show is uh, this show is big. And then I I got my own action card, which I'd never had before. So I was uh, very excited to get an action card of Malik. But yeah, no, it wasn't until then that I realized it was a, a super popular with fans all over the world. And I suppose, uh, Peter, coming into that sort of franchise and you're playing a character, Malik, and you're acting out your sort of scenes and obviously you don't know about that sort of vice protection, uh, what's going on, making you sort of sound uh, like that sort of Gaul sort of vice character. When you heard that back and when you saw that back for the first time, were you sort of amused in terms of how your vice was sort of altered or tweaked uh, in terms of because I imagine that or did you even when you were talking those lines could you talk them normally or did you feel right I need to put a bit of a tone into my voice or do you feel just oh well they're just going to project it anyway and just going to talk normal 
No, I remember it was Peter DeLuise who told me, uh, by the way, this is we're going to modulate your voice for this. And I was like, what? And I realized then that I was really a host to a symbiont uh, being. And I this was some of the detail that you don't read when you read the black. Right. This is some mm. of the culture. And so I uh, I did not know any of that. And it was Peter DeLuise who told me that I would not be sounding myself. And so that is when I first realized that I was host to a symbiont and also that they were going to modulate my voice in post. Yeah, I did not know. It didn't write that in anywhere in the script. It didn't say anything about that. So I just read the line straight and they did all that in post-production. And did you want to see that post-production before it started shooting in air? Did you want to see how that modulation sort of worked or were you sort of not too conscious about it? I wasn't too self-conscious about it. I, I found the my that particular character to be a bit Shakespearean. You know, I I thought the whole thing, the whole drama, was a bit Shakespearean. It was, it was um, big in scope and uh, you know, warring tribes and this type of thing. And I just sort of embraced the language of it. I embraced it, and I sort of took on a sort of a body language that I felt was appropriate for this character and it just all fell in i sort of it came to me all very naturally it seemed mm. and obviously with makeup and special effects and obviously in the episode and the stunning eyes and the glowing eyes and the sort of changing of sort of voice and everything that sort of went uh, through that in terms of the special effects did you get to see firsthand in terms of the costume makers, the design makers, the stage hands, uh, the people that were obviously, because you did a good bit of, um, dare I say, block shooting on location, because some of those shots were out outdoor sort of shots that she sort of did in terms of some of those weapons being fired and sort of gunfire in terms of that. So did you get to see the whole production really take stage outside of what would be a normal studio lot? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we did a, a fair amount of on-location shooting, if I remember correctly. And I, uh, I mean, it was a, it was a fairly big and fairly slick operation. I mean, I remember, uh, I can remember distinctly the texture of my costume, like it, it had almost um, like a not a snake skin, but it had a, it had, it felt like. A, almost like a sea sponge or something a quality I remember really liking my outfits I, and and uh, just you know the apparatus to get that show up and running was fairly big you know they seemed to have a sizable budget I mean aside from the um, bags of gold they were paying Richard Dean Anderson but I but it seemed to have a, a sizable budget and it, and it felt like I was part of a, a big production. A big production with a uh, which large large scope. It just felt like, and then and it would. By the time I joined, it was a fairly well running machine. It was fairly slick. It seemed to get kind of slicker and slicker as seasons went on, kind of thing. And Peter, when you were there, in terms of the roles, your character was it an eight day sort of wrap, uh, eight day sort of turnaround for you in terms of from the moment you walked in that door to the moment you exit that door before you sort of would come back again in terms of in terms of what what they were able to achieve in terms of producing an episode of Stargate, or is that those memories a bit blurry? Well, they're a bit blurry, but I don't think any day was shot for less than a 10, 11, 12 hour days. I think that is typical on that show. They don't, um, I don't remember doing any eight hour days. That would have been pure luxury, I think. They were, they were quite involved. And, and so from door to door, you're looking at like, by the time you get picked up to the time you get dropped off, you're probably looking at 13 hours, 14 hours sometimes. And Peter, most of your interactions are with sort of Christopher George, and you have a few extra interactions with Tony Amadola, who we've spoken to previously in sort of season one. And do you ever get to come across uh, Richard Dean Anderson in terms of more interaction with him, maybe offset or off shooting? And how did you find him as a character person? Because obviously, for so many years, he carried that sort of show in terms of this Jack O'Neill sort of larger than life character and did you feel at any times that it sort of got to him the sort of pressures of it? Not at all. My experience of Richard Dean Anderson was he was a very cool customer and I think um, you know he had been a he had headlined a, a bunch of very successful shows so um, 
you know, he, they brought him in at the last minute and he was the first to get out of there as well. Mm -hmm. But I also felt that he was generous. He was professional. I, um, I heard a story about him that I thought was quite funny that I still tell to this day where he had a rule that if his dialogue was more than two fingers in thickness, he wouldn't say it. So he had this kind of two finger thickness rule that like, which is why he always got the one line quips and all the cool dialogue in part because he wasn't going to say a bunch of exposition if it was written, if it was thicker than two fingers. So I always thought that story was pretty cool. And wouldn't it be nice to get to a position where you uh, didn't have to say more than that much dialogue and get as paid as much as he was getting paid. But I think he was a good leader. You know, he was not, uh, I don't remember him being temperamental. I, mem I remember him being uh, just typically generous, gracious, and uh, a nice guy. And I suppose, uh, Peter, in terms of that sort of universe and in being involved in Canada and uh, the Stargate universe, when sort of spin-off shows came about, uh, were there ever opportunities for you to get involved further down the line in terms of uh, Stargate universe, Stargate Atlantis, uh, other sort of opportunities within that universe? Or did you feel that you had your sort of cup of tea when you sort of appeared in Stargate SG-1 and uh, to go back would be sort of different for you? Well, I remember being offered more episodes of Stargate, and it was really just a question of uh, scheduling conflicts that I couldn't do. So, and then I think I got series work. I got a couple of jobs in in a in in Toronto that took me to Toronto, and so I sort of left British Columbia, left Vancouver, and so I just wasn't available as available as I was in part because I was a working actor on other shows and in part because I just wasn't around to do those guest star parts and that type of thing. So I, 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 I would have gone back. I would have been happy to have gone back. Um, I, had, I remember having a lot of fun, what, particularly with Michael Shanks and Chris Judge. I remember having a lot of fun with those guys. Um, yeah, I most definitely would have gone back. And certain Peter DeLuise, who directed a lot of those episodes, he was uh, just a delightful guy to work for. Uh, he was always, uh, you know, making set fun. He had a great sense of humor. Um, yeah, no, I would have gone back in a heartbeat, but I, opportunity never arose. And I suppose, uh, speaking to you now, Peter, and before we came on air, you mentioned that there is a link between you and Stargate Atlantis uh, at the moment uh, that you're currently working alongside Tor Tori Higginson, who played the role of Dr. Janet Weir, uh, the main sort of protagonist uh, in uh, Stargate Atlantis. You sort of hooked up now in terms of uh, putting the two shows side by side in a new adventure. Well, that's right. So uh, I first met Tori, I'm going to say, I'm just going to say 17 years ago at a, at a Stargate convention in London. And Tori and I got on like a house on fire. We had this very platonic, but somewhat romantic evening on the streets of London, just talking about life and the universe. And we were we talked until four or five in the morning, I remember. We had just a delightful time. And I hadn't seen her or spoken to her in 17 years until about a week or two weeks ago. I'm directing a television show that she's doing right now that she's one of the stars of called Transplant. It's a hospital show. And so we got to relive that whole like night 17 years ago when we were at that Stargate convention and we were actually talking about Stargate fans. I mentioned that you had made contact and wanted to kind of uh, interview me for this. So we talked about this, um, just how- Did she mention Peter that I interviewed her in season one? <laughs> she didn't, I didn't, no. I, she didn't say that. She didn't say that. I probably didn't drop your name, Jim. I, um, I, I just said that um, a gentleman from Ireland was, uh, was going to interview me. And uh, so we just talked about how generous those fans have been with us and what it's meant to us to be um you know just a part of that world so we had that lovely conversation and we and we had it was just a treat working with her she's just a consummate professional and a lovely human being and it was just really nice to see her after 17 years or what have you and Peter, now for the final question, uh, I asked this uh, just before to David McNally, and I'm going to ask it you, I ask it to sort of everyone. Let's pretend there was a Stargate uh, encyclopedia as such. 
for all the characters who played a role in Stargate throughout the years, throughout the genres, throughout the different spin-off shows. And your character, Malik, was put into that encyclopedia and two blank sentences were left underneath his name, a synopsis as such, not really an epitaph, but a synopsis to describe that character. And the talent agent came to you, Peter Stebbing, and they asked you to write those two sentences to summarize Malik up. What would you like those two sentences to read? Well, I think I think it would be right. I think it would be he would be um, uh, he would be a leader that deserves his own show. I think it's clearly that's probably just one sentence, right? A leader, yeah. a whole you can design a whole show around this uh, wonderful character and the Tokra and that those symbionts. I would like to know more about those symbionts. So I, I would say worthy of his own series is what I would say. How about that, Jim? Worthy of his own series. Uh, no doubt dropping a bomb to Peter DeLuise if he somehow is listening uh, online to what we're saying or uh, gets to see this uh, later on. But for the moment, uh, Peter Stebbing, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Thanks for sharing uh, your memories of your time on uh, Stargate SG-1 playing the Tokra Malik. Uh, we do hope there's many opportunities for you in the future to explore what is a never-ending sort of saga, the Star Stargate universe, with, with which we hear new movies, new TV series, uh, no, no doubt in the line in the very near future, uh, one suspects uh, a, a sort of a big secret, which everyone sort of knows that it's coming around again. Uh, but for the moment, uh, Peter Stebbing, thanks for sharing your thoughts, sharing your memories. And uh, peace, God, uh, the mountain biking uh, will have a, a pleasant uh, experience for you also. But for the moment, Peter Stebbing, take care and God bless. Thank you. And to you, Jim. Thanks for touching base. Okay. Bye.